Hello and welcome back to the Rimworld tutorial. Let's have a small recap. In the previous episode, we created these three people, by which I mean we allowed these three people to survive the crash and everybody else died horribly. That's fine. Uh, try not to think about it if it helps. We built a steel wall to try and increase the defense and remove the flammability of wooden walls, although steel is a little bit expensive. Steel is very useful in many things. We opted for a steel wall uh, just because it seemed like a good idea at the time. We have placed down three sleeping spots. We have a dog. Well, obviously one sleeping spot for each person. We have a dog and I believe we rolled someone who has a decent amount of handling ability. Yeah, a, a six here, a one here, and a three. So we've got a, at least one animal handler, so that's good. We have some vomit on the ground because someone ha was sick and I've just realized that I did not unforbid the components. The components is new in Alpha 13 and is simply electronic components. It's just a material, uh, uh, a reagent, if you will, in the recipes of various things. But we haven't built anything that requires them. In this episode, I said that we would probably look at the next step, which is going to be research. It's going to be defense and therefore offense, you know, rescuing us from raids, basically. We're also going to have to look at our continued survival, which will involve meals, which means cooking. All of this is ultimately going to involve electricity because we want to cook. But there are alternatives, so we will uh, explore some of those first. Um, I think the first thing we want to do, though, is to put... All this stuff is just lying around, right? It's not great. The Glitter World Medicine... Well, it's just normal medicine. If you uh, have a look at it, this doesn't go off. Uh, especially in the rain. So it, two something a day. I assume that means two hit points a day. So, normally it would say it would expire, but it doesn't seem to be. So, it seems to be okay for now. It has 100% uh, hit points. Medicine is going to be useful if anybody gets injured, but it will run out. We have 8 plus 8 plus 8. So, we have 24 of them, which isn't going to last that long at all. It seems like a lot, but each I think each operation requires one medicine, irrespective of what it is. Some may require more. Uh, so, 24 medicine is going to heal people for 24 maybe hit points with. I don't know. Uh, so, ooh, what's this? Displaying animal names. Oh, we can show the animal name! Sweet. I got sidetracked. We built this room. So what we need to do now is try and get these things into a sensible position. You notice, by the way, when I box select these, it selects everything that we can unforbid. It selects carryable, haulable stuff. It didn't select this. Now, this is a steel slag chunk, which later on we can turn into steel. But right now we can't really do anything with. Similarly, it won't select these chunks. But if I select just these, it does select the chunks. That's because there is a sort of a priority system to uh, to the box select. First of off, first off, it will select the colonists. If there's no colonists, it will select this sort of thing, forbiddable things, carryable things, usable things. If not that, oh, I wonder. Yeah, if not that, then excuse me, animals. If not animals, then, excuse me, that's an animal, chunks. And I wonder if we can select trees. We can't select trees. So there's a hierarchy there. So if you can't select what you want, either zoom in and double click it so you can select a whole lot, or just shift click to select more. That is all fine, but we need somewhere to put these things. So what we usually do first is we create a zone. I'm clicking on architect. Basically everything you ever do is in the architect menu. We'll look at the other menus in future. I'm going to set up a stockpile zone. This is going to be where stuff that you actually give a toss about is stored. Where? Good question. Now I'm going to plan ahead. I'm going to at some point want the stockpile zone to be inside. I'm going to want a room with the stockpile in it. So what I think I'll do is I'll put the stockpile zone here and I'm just clicking and dragging to do this. Uh, I'll probably just put it here for now. We don't need a huge one, but we can make it bigger in future. This is going to be for basically everything. And we'll show you how these works. Until you click away, you can right click to sort of undo everything. Or whilst you're in this menu, you can just click somewhere else, right? Now, it's not as obvious as you'd like it to be, but there is a stockpile here and you can click on it. Stockpile zone one, you can rename it to uh, dry storage, I guess. So at some point, that stockpile will contain our dry goods, i.e. silver, uh, the the steel blocks, components, that sort of thing. Stuff that basically doesn't need to be refrigerated. 
So this is the place where condensation will not be, but currently it's going to be for everything. And here is the button that determines what goes in it. Now, why would you want to determine what goes in it? Well, you don't want to refrigerate steel and you don't want meat to go off, right? You also don't want to have corpses and things in places where people go. And you don't want to fill up uh, an important stockpile with unimportant stuff like chunks. I mean, the game already considers these chunks to be less important than these things. So this stuff is considered to be dumped and this stuff is considered to be stored. So by default, a storage stockpile already doesn't allow chunks. It also only allows colonist corpses and stranger corpses. Now that's an interesting thing because these two things are considered to be sort of high priority. They're, they're real things. They're things we care about. Um, although I'm not sure why that's on, but not that. Maybe that overrides those. I'm not sure. So you can set human corpses if you wanted to. Uh, maybe if you set that, it's already those two. So I'm guessing it would not allow any human corpses in this stockpile. If you turned it on, it would allow colonists and stranger corpses. But currently, I don't want any corpses in here because unless we've butchered them, they're going to start to rot. And if they start to rot, people are going to be grossed out by it. And basically, we want anything that's rotting to be out of the way in the bin. Fair. So instead, we're going to... Oh. Well, we're not... It says allow rotten here, which we might as well turn off just in case I forget about it. But I've not really allowed anything that can rot. So that's currently having no effect, but I've turned it off just in case. Resources, all foods, all manufactured stuff. If you click through these, you can get some idea about how the categorization works. Basically, this is everything except for chunks, i.e. this stuff and this stuff. So everything else is going to go into here. And now that I've created this, some of the colonists are going to go and pick stuff up. And I'm going to press 1 to go to slow mode and we should see Tony is already picking stuff up. If you click on someone, it'll tell you what they're doing. So this person has decided to haul the medicine. This person is hauling a heck of a lot of silver to dry storage. And this is why it's useful to name these things because you can see where they're taking it. It would just say stockpile zone one, which is not great, but don't forget, or rather do notice, if you click on someone, it shows you where they're putting it. This is the path that they're gonna take. If this path goes past something extremely dangerous, you probably want to do something about it, and we'll look at that in the future. But for now, we'll just let them deal with this. Houston's having a meal, which we're also going to run out of. But now that we've got a stockpile, look up here. We have uh, a list of all the things that we have in the stockpile, which is another benefit to having a stockpile, apart from the fact that things are strewn all over the map and we don't want to have to go miles to pick up food and wood, etc. We've also got the ability to actually have some idea of what we have. In Dwarf Fortress you need a bookkeeper to know how many things you've got. In this game, you don't, which is really nice because I found that slightly tiresome to have to have a single person to know exactly how much stuff you've got. But I suppose in Dwarf Fortress, there's a, it's a lot higher level. In this, you've got currently three people. In Dwarf Fortress, you have 17. You sort of ignore them. You don't give them individual jobs. You let them get on with it. So it's you're closer to the action in this game. You can uh, toggle the the menus there so if you have a look here this one includes uh, medicine and this one includes silver but we've only got medicine and silver so we've actually got more stuff at the moment than we normally would if we didn't uh, categorize it in this case it would just list everything that you have which quickly fills up the screen so i like to turn this button down here on just to you know just to categorize them it doesn't stack them if you, unfortunately so it's not obvious that that is below that if you see what i mean you get used to it. Um, but it tells you that you have 541 silver and 24 medicine. And it actually tells you here, this metal, metal is mostly used as a commodity currency. So when we do get to trading, if a trader shows up, we'll spend or gain silver in order to sell or buy goods, which is often useful because sometimes they turn up with a, a very clutch amount of food, just as you're about to all starve. So we're going to let this play at one speed just to show you what everyone's doing. This chap is carrying only 75 steel. There's a limited amount that each person can carry in each consignment to the stockpile. And these, I don't think packaged survival meals go off. I think that's basically it's telling you here. There's no degradation listed here. If they're going to go off, it will tell you when they spoil. It doesn't say that, so they're not going to. If you want to select a stockpile and the stockpile is full, you just click twice slowly. If you double click fast, it selects all the thing that you clicked on. If you click again on any tile that's already selected, you'll start selecting through. There could be several things in one tile. So you just keep clicking until you get to what you want. 
Uh, here it's drive storage and obviously you can interact with it. You can also delete it and you can copy and paste settings. So if you want to move the stockpile or have another one that does the same thing, you can copy paste the settings here as well. You can also hide it, uh, which I think just changes the visibility of it when you haven't got it selected. But honestly, this one's chosen a color that is not very visible. Anyway, so whatever. Uh, once all these people have done all these things, we're going to need to start worrying about jobs. Obviously, we chose people who are capable at various things, and currently we're all just doing menial labour. Which is why I didn't want anybody who was incapable of hauling or cleaning, because if all these people were incapable of both of those, one of these people would be sat around doing nothing. Now let's pause it, spacebar again, don't forget. And you can go through your colonists with the dot and comma keys, which are basically the two arrows next to the question mark, but you don't have to press shift. You can press shift, I have discovered, but you don't have to. Uh, and therefore you can click on the character, and you can just scroll through people until you find the one who's got the highest value at a thing. So we're going to look for the highest minor, which happens to be uh, two, which is pretty poor, because we're going to want to start mining out some of this stuff, which is compacted steel. Now you can click on any of these. Remember, you can click on anything in the whole game to find what you want. Over here, we have some components. Well, it's compacted machinery, but it mines into components. More steel over here. There's some silver there, which is going to be worth mining out in future because it will give us a little bit more economical power. And at some point, some of those colonists are going to wander over here and pick up these packaged survival meals as well, which will be good because currently we only have 28 food altogether. So you can see these are expanding as we, uh, like we've got more things now that we've got more things, if that makes sense. They will go and get the steel down there. They'll go and get the meals over here. It will all be swell and far out. But we're going to want to mine through here. It will give us not only the steel, but more chunks. And later we can use those chunks to build with. But for now, we're going to think about just mining out. So we're going to go to Architect, Orders, and then Mine. Now, you can do this one tile at a time. If I right-click here, it cancels the thing we're doing. In most situations, the thing you're doing can be cancelled with a right-click. So if I right-click again, it's cancelled again. If I click this, Mine is an option. However, pressing a thing and then Mine and then a thing and then Mine, even if you click on them individually and press L instead, unless you only want to do a few things, that's kind of tedious. So we'll go to Orders, we'll go to Mine, and we'll just drag a box. Now, if you don't want to do it, again, right-click, it will stop. But we're going to mine out this. And in fact, I'm going to cancel this for now. Again, I've selected Cancel. I've dragged a box. It won't activate anything that it can't. So if you try and mine, and there's nothing to mine, it just tells you off. If you try and mine, and you want... If you wanted to mine this in line with this, you could drag all the way over here, and it'll s select the ones that you care about, right? which is true of anything, as long as it can be done to a thing, it will apply to the thing in the box that you select. But I think I'm also going to mine out this. Now, I'm reluctant to mine out this. Uh, I mean, we might as well start making square rooms, right? Um, I was kind of reluctant to mine out that because there'd be a gap here. I'm not sure that actually matters. But what we can do is we can go back to structure. We could just build another steel wall. And then we'll have a square room. At some point, people are going to be upset by these walls. Because they're not very nice. Uh, and everything's going really slowly. Let's press 3 and get it up to full speed here. Now, you see, Tony is our best uh, miner. And it's still taking forever. I mean... Excuse me, will you... Okay. She's decided to stop. She's eaten because she was hungry. That's fair. You're allowed to do that. But what's happened now is that she's gone off and she's mined this one. Now, as long as a person can do something, you can select that person, right-click on the thing that you want them to do, and tell them to do it. And then she'll go off and do that one instead. Finish that off. Now we have more steel. And then she'll continue with what she was doing. So I was feeling a little bit miffed that she decided to, you know, get one 90% done and then do a different one because she got hungry halfway through. It's just part of the AI, so don't worry too much about it. It's not like that person is particularly out to get you. But... On the other hand, maybe they are. So, at any time, if you want something done now, you simply find someone who can do it and tell them to do it. So, in this case, Yefim is not a miner. In this case, Houston is not a miner. So, literally, Tony is the only person who's going to do it. Uh, which is... Pardon? Yefim is clear. All right. What does it mean by not a miner? We might as well talk about this now because we're in the doing work part of the game. I'm going to leave this to go, but I may pause it in the background with spacebar, don't forget. There's a work tab, which is not one of the ones we've looked at before. Currently, we just have yeses and noes. You either will or will not do these things, which is pretty decent to start off with if it's your first game. Ah. 
Ah. Let's we'll come back to this. Um, if it's your first game, A, you probably didn't want to put it on rough mode. And B, you probably want to leave this like this until you have some idea of what these are doing. However, in order for this tutorial series to be relevant to mine, Avax, and everyone else's Let's Play series, I'm actually going to have to switch this to the priority system that they're doing. But the first thing I'm going to do is actually explain it. These are the jobs that you can do. Firefight, patient, doctor, patient. You can read. I'm not going to read them all out. If there's a tick, they will do it. If there is not, they will not. It said Yefim is not a minor. Cannot prioritize. Is not a minor. Because, excuse me, it's not on. And the game will automatically determine whether a person should be doing something or not. Not based on these little flames, which is their passion, but based on their skill. And their skill is determined by or rather is displayed by the colour of the box here. So these um, grey ones with the black border is basically zero. I think it's literally zero in all cases. So as the border gets lighter, you can see that the skill gets higher. So this white one here, 13, and nearly white anyway, got a 9 here and a 10 here. So you can determine if you want someone to do something without having to click through everybody by first of all having a glance to see who's got the lighter coloured boxes. And then you can hover over it and it tells you how much you know, they can do. I would like somebody else. Basically, I want everybody to mine. But you can see here it says higher priority in this direction and lower priority in that direction. So if I put mine on here, then nobody's going to haul or clean because everyone's going to dig this stuff out before they go off to get stuff. Hauling is important because that stuff is miles away. Cleaning is important because there's vomit on the ground and people are going to get irritated by it. Let's have a look at these people's needs. Eight without table, feeling bad. Maybe that table. Where's our other person? Houston. Uncomfortable. We need to get something soft to sit on. So you can see that furniture is going to be useful in the future. But as they walk around this sick, they're going to get a debuff because of the bad environment. So we'll go back to the work tab. If I turn hauling and cleaning off, people won't do it. Furthermore, research is never going to happen because Yefim is basically doing everything else first. So we turn on manual priorities. Now we have numbers. You'll see in Avax series that first thing we do is put firefight on one for everybody who can. That means if there's ever a fire, people will drop what they're doing, try and sort it out. Patient is also a one. This means if you are in any sort of situation where you need a doctor to see to you, the doctor will see to you. And then uh, bed rest you will put on two and then flick will be a one. Now, I'm going to put doctoring on one for Yefim, who has the highest skill, I think. Yep. And on two for Tony. Now, the reason for this is that if someone needs treatment, I want them to do it straight away. I want the doctor to doctor the person ASAP. The only time that's not going to be possible is if the doctor is really, really busy doing something else, and Tony is not, which means Tony can do it if Yefim hasn't dropped what he's doing and started doing it already, or if Yefim is incapable because he is also down for the count, someone else can do it. In that situation, we might go in and reassess the priorities to make sure that Tony does it, or we could just select Tony and right-click on the person who we want to be healed and tell them to do it. Also an option. So these numbers override this priority list. Now, Firefight is here already, but don't forget, if we had priority on uh, Firefight priority on two for Tony, Tony would be a patient before Tony did firefighting. And if we put anything else on one, like this, now Tony is going to research before firefighting, which is silly. By the way, it's left click to go up and right click to go down. But basically it's click and if it goes the wrong way, do the other click because I never do it right. So I'm going to put firefight on one, flick on one. Now flicking is going to be important in the future. Currently nobody has it because there's not going to be anything to turn on or off. Uh, but when there is, there is. That's going to be when we turn on our guns. It's going to be when we turn on our backup batteries. It's going to be when we turn on lights, uh, heaters, things like that. If these things need turning on, we need them turning on now because the thing that is off is a problem when it's off. Or if it's on, it's a problem when it's on. Like If you want to turn a heater off because it's really hot in a room, well, the heater won't actually be using anything if it's really hot in a room, but we don't want necessarily a heater to be heating something up if we're not using that room, right? So if the room is cold, but there's nobody in it, I don't care. I want to turn the heater off to save power. That's slightly less urgent, but usually turning things on is very urgent indeed. So let's have a look at the other things. We have Doctor set to two. Now, Avak has taught me this trick. Um, if you watch Quill's series, Quill will use one as 
uh, a main priority. The Avax trick is to use two as the main job, and then one as sort of like a an out of band, super important thing to do. So I've put Doctor as a super important thing to do for Yethim, but not as Tony. Tony is just going to be the Doctor. Yethim is going to be the emergency Doctor. So one is going to be my emergency job number. So firefighting is an emergency. Patienting is an emergency. Flick, when I tell a flick to be done, is an emergency. Everything else will be a two. So bed rest will be a two. Bed rest is when you've got cuts and bruises, but you just need to lie down to get over it. Patient is when your arm's off. You know, this is just a flesh wound, your arm's off, right? And then doctor is in the middle, so you can get out of bed if you're okay to treat a patient, but you won't get out of bed if you're a patient to treat a bed rest. Wardening. Wardening is basically talking to prisoners, as you can see. Um, yeah, it's literally prisoners. So we'll put this on a two. Houston is a very good warden with a high social skill. So Houston's job, my main job, because it's a two, is going to be warden. But we also need people to be able to mine. So I'll put everyone on a three of mine. So if they haven't got any wardening to do, they will mine. Tony is the only actually decent miner that we have. So Tony's going to be, primary job is going to be mining. Tony's primary job is also going to be growing and cooking. Now this is pretty bad. Um, the fact that we have a three cook is intentional. I think I mentioned it when we actually set up the colonists. We need at least a three in order to create food that won't poison people. However, you can butcher food at any level and gain cooking levels. So if we put these two on a... F put this person on a four because they have a passion for it. Yefim is never going to cook. No passion, no skill. Doesn't give a toss. But Tony is going to level up fast and is already capable of cooking meals. So Tony's primary job will be cooking. Yes, we know this. We saw this yesterday. Um, handling is going to be a three job. Now, handling is not as important, but it doesn't happen very often. And also, you have to actually set up that job on the animal. We'll look at that future in future, but I'll put the uh, handling on here. The reason it's a three job here is they're not very good at it, but they do have some passion for it. So if it needs doing, they might as well try, okay? We do have a primary handler with a level of six, so it's going to be a two for you. Again, usually the person who's higher priority it is will get around to it first but they may be doing something else i might have set up a higher priority task like i might have set up an emergency task at one or they might just be halfway through mining and you know the dog can wait and then tony's just finished cooking and goes to handle the dog right if there's nothing if there's no cooking left the handling will happen but notice that now cooking is two handling is three even though this is lower priority in this direction two is a higher number will happen first Construction, I'm going to put everybody on it, because early on in the game, you want things to be built and you want them to be built now. But, again, Yefim is the person who's most capable of it, so that's going to be a two there. Repairing, I think it only affects the speed at which they repair. So basically, I'm going to give everyone a three here. Ah. Construction repair... The thing is, repair covers a lot more than just building stuff. It's not just walls, it's... Um, it's it's broken down heaters, it's broken down solar panels, it's broken down guns. It's more than just damage to walls caused by people attacking them. It's when things go wrong as well. So often you want repair to be higher than construction, but not very often, if you see what I mean. Construction is not always on. We don't always have things to construct. Um, and I can always, you know, put it as an emergency job if it needs doing, or literally just say, go and repair that. So I'm going to leave these two as a two. Sometimes I think repair should be before construct because it happens a lot less often. But I don't want it to be so much higher that it overrides everything. So I'm going to leave this as it is. And if things need to happen, we'll adjust these over time. Now, growing is the important thing at the moment because we do have a limited window for growing crops and we're currently not growing any. Uh, Tony's job is going to be growing and I've already put that on two. And they have a great passion for it but they're not very good at it. Now this person has, now one of these people is a green thumb. So so Houston has a green thumb, which means they get a mood benefit from growing stuff. So here, they will get a plus two. Every time they plant a plant, they'll get plus two on here, which is extremely useful. So if you go back to the work tab, by the way, I pressed the, um, the dot and comma buttons to get to these people. So let's have a look at that again. I clicked on 
I press the button, which was dot. It selected Tony. Tony is the first one in the list. I press character. And then I was looking down here and I was pressing dot and comma to find the one that said green thumb, which was Houston. So now I know what I'm doing. That's how I did that there. And I'm going to go to work. I'm going to find Houston. I'm going to say, actually, Houston, you're going to be our primary grower because not only are you good at it and have a passion for it, but you will get a huge mood benefit for doing so. Uh, while you've got a three, you do have a four as well, but you have less of a passion for it. And again, no green thumb, no mood benefit, which means we have one primary miner here, which is fine because you're the only person who's good at it. But now we've turned these on, we can actually tell these two to prioritize it. Previously, when we had it on uh, non-manual priorities, these two were blank. So these two literally wouldn't do it. We couldn't tell them to prioritize it. Plant cut... I'm not sure about plant cutting. I mean, I tend to feel like if something needs harvesting, you do it now. But also you can cut down plants away in the distance. Like you can chop down trees and things like that. Uh, so those are way less urgent often. So if I want a harvest to happen, it needs to happen now. But if I want wood chopping, I want it to happen at some point. So what I think we might do here is simply have this as a sort of a primary task for the same person who's doing the mining. It's basically resource gathering. I'm going to turn these off because we can't do them for now. But do note that smithing and tailoring is something that Yefim is incredibly good at and has a passion for. So it's probably going to be their primary task. In fact, we might as well make it their primary task because if we can't do it, it's not going to show up. Art, again, is something that in future we will be able to do, but at this point there's no point even setting it up. We might as well leave it as a, like a secondary task. It's difficult to, like, obviously it's a level 3 priority, but it's a secondary task, not a tertiary task, because our primary task is at 2, so it's, it's N-1. Uh, crafting, I will put everybody on at least a 3, because if I want something making, I want it making. Uh, stone cutting, smelting, and more. That is a... That's different from constructing. So if there's anything that's got a blueprint, that's constructing. If there's anything at a table, that's crafting. Anything that's not these three. So uh, as it says, stone cutting and smelting are two of those. And then I'm going to do this thing that Avac does, which is to set like this. Um, so one person is going to prioritize cleaning over hauling, and two people are going to prioritize hauling over cleaning. But nobody is going to prioritize over everything unless I really, really want something to happen, at which point I will just increase these to one at some point. And then research, we might as well put everyone on like, a, you can have a four because you're really bad at it. But if you learn, that's good too. You might as well have a four as well. It's obviously your like main job. We'll put it on a two because it will still be outranked by anything to the left, which is everything. But of course, it won't be outranked by crafting, won't be outranked by cleaning, but it will be outranked by hauling. So if there's nothing for you to do, yet, and in time, this will be the case. At the moment, it seems like you've got a lot of jobs. But obviously, these two are never going to happen. In fact, these four are never going to happen. These ones are sort of, you know, occasional, and this is a level three anyway. These two, if I want them to happen, they'll happen. But again, we're now down to two jobs that are a problem. And handling is such an occasional thing anyway, it will just interrupt your research sometimes. So really, unless there's construction and repair to do at the moment, You'll be researching and then we haven't even got a research table so you can see how even though there's a lot of things if you set up the priority the priority is okay at least in a sensible way nobody is overworked and you can always reprioritize temporarily if you want something to happen now if like there's an emergency situation and you need to fix the guns or build a wall to stop people getting in because it hasn't been finished yet or you need to mine out some steel to finish it etc you can still increase the priority uh, and deal with it that way. You notice we've actually got Houston selected. We can see that he is carrying a package survival meal to dry storage, um, which is a very useful thing. That's not the sort of thing you get from Dwarf Fortress, where you can't actually select anybody, and you certainly can't see where they're going. Um, but you don't have, again, you don't have to be so in the business. You don't have to deal with each dwarf individually at that stage either. So it's it's similar to Dwarf Fortress in many ways, but also in like in this sort of situation in Dwarf Fortress, you just don't have to be quite so specific about it. I'm going to go put this down to one speed. I'm pressing the one, two, three keys on the keyboard here to do this. And we're going to look at this. As Houston draws near the ancient wall, a sense of foreboding overcomes him. He isn't sure why, but he feels that this dusty structure may contain great danger. If you remember, when I saw this building, when we started, I said there's probably bad stuff in there and it will tell you if there is. Basically what that means is if we open this, we're going to get attacked by mechanoids. As soon as you've played one game and discovered that, 
you will never open one of these again unless you're extremely ready for it. However, there is cool stuff inside. So it's it's like a, a late game boss fight that you can deal with to get some mad loot. Yerin, where are you going? Uh, Yefim, where are you going? So you can see the line shows you that he's going to pick this up. He will pick up more things if they're close enough. And hopefully this bear is not hungry. We click on it. We go needs. Plenty of food. It's not even slightly hungry. So the bear's probably not going to attack Yefim. And it has no injuries, so it's going to be difficult to take down. Speaking of food, though, we're going to start getting hungry soon, too. Now, he is picking up some survival meals, but we only have 29 food for three people, which is 10 meals each, basically, until he brings them back. So what we're going to have to think about doing, once we've mined this out... I mean, I'm just mining this out for steel, but partially I kind of want to keep building steel walls, because they're less flammable than wood walls, um, and higher defensively. So building steel walls early, it costs you a lot of steel, but it means that your primary structure is quite well defended, which is going to be useful for our first raid, basically. And the raid will come up, if we click on here and um, go to options, click choose storyteller, it reminds you what you're using. So we're on rough and we've got Cassandra Classic. So Cassandra will at some point set us up with a raid, someone's going to attack us. Equally, Cassandra could set us up with some visitors wherein someone might trade with us. So, you know, much of a muchness. Let's see about the things that we're going to need for the future then. <coughs> oh, pardon me. If we have a look in power, we already know how to make power conduits, solar generators, fuels generators, batteries and wind turbines, which in my opinion is very advanced technology, especially for some people who have crashed on some, possibly a prisoner ship. Again, not entirely sure about that, but let's go with it. Um, so we can, we can already produce power. There are things that we can use that need power. For example, the electric stove. But we can also create a fueled stove. And if you watch Avax, at least the first of the Alpha 13 series, Avax will actually produce a... Now, where is it? Furniture... Misc. Temperature. A campfire. Now, a campfire will keep this place warm and allow us to cook food at the expense of wood. I'm not as tempted to do that as you might think, because currently it's 21 degrees in that place there. And it's 20, it's 18 out here. Somehow that's hotter than that, but okay. We'll uh, let it be. I'm assuming this will cool down over time, but these walls are quite well insulated, so I'm guessing that's how that works. There's 19 somewhere. 19 at the door. Yeah, it's cooling down in here, but we're not going to need the temperature. So I'm not going to build the campfire, because if it rains, it will probably extinguish it. Excuse me, if the campfire is outside. But what we can do is we can create maybe a fueled stove, which will allow us to use wood to cook food, which is definitely something we want to be doing. Um, now, you notice when we click fueled stove, we can't choose the material. And it's the same with the electric stove. These have a material listed. Steel, electric, steel, hand -tone, steel, right? If you click those, you can choose the material. This doesn't give you the option. These have a fixed amount of... Uh, uh, items that you need to create them, a fixed cost. Whereas these ones, you see how it's 125 steel. Let's click on this. 125 steel, three components to build a steel electric tailoring bench, for example. If you click on wood, it's 50 steel and 75 wood. So it's 50 steel irrespective of what you make it out of. 1500 silver. Irresponsible use of silver. Um, but you can make a tailoring bench out of wood because it's a tailoring bench. You can't really make a stove out of wood because it would just catch fire and burn down. We might as well speed it up to three speed during the night. Now, one thing that I am not sure about, is sometimes I build outside and sometimes I build inside. Now, when it comes to things like cooking, what you are going to be thinking about in the future is that the place you cook the food and possibly the place you butcher the animals are going to be nearby and they're also going to be near a cold room where you keep the stuff. Currently, we don't have a cold room, but it might be worthwhile thinking about the fact that maybe you want to divide this room into two rooms, have half of it as a cold room and the other half of it as a production room. So we're thinking ahead. You can't deconstruct a fuel stove, an electric stove, or possibly... I don't think you can de deconstruct any of these things, basically. So we're going to build a fuel stove here so that we don't have to use any... Um, don't have to use any components on building the power network yet. 
I put it down to one speed so I can talk about this whilst it's happening. Yethim has immediately gone ahead to do that because if you look at the work, Yethim's primary job is to construct when they're not handling. And that's a construction job because it was a blueprint, which is different from a crafting job, which would be a bill made at one of these tables. I clicked away with the left button there, but you could easily use the right button too. If you right click again when there's nothing happening, it brings back the menu that you previously had, which is actually quite useful. So you're going to fuel this stove. What we're going to do is we're going to click on it. Let's pause it with the space bar. If you click on Yefim, refueling fuel stove. Thank you. You have to tell them to do stuff. You can't just build the table. You actually have to tell them to do stuff. If you add a bill, you can see you can cook three types of meals, which are the same three as in Dwarf Fortress, except I think lavish is called something else in Dwarf Fortress. But we're going to be cooking simple meals. And I'm going to click on like, do X times. This bill will go away when the person's built one simple meal, which is not useful because then they won't make another one ever again. There are three options. Do as do this many, do until you have this many, and just do forever. I like to do forever simple meals, at least at the start, because we currently do not have a fridge. Now, the thing there is, if you don't have a fridge, anything you would make the simple meals out of will go off. However, once it's cooked, the shelf life increases greatly. So you can have a good stockpile of meals once they're cooked and keep them outside for a reasonably large period of time. And then suddenly they go off, but they'll have been eaten. But by that time, you've got a fridge and you've sorted everything out. So we're going to do simple meal forever. So as long as we've got the materials, people will cook meals. But what are the materials? Let's click on details. Meat, vegetarian and animal products. You can cook with rotten meat up to a point. I think they know at what point it's okay to cook rotten and not cook rotten, but you can basically get back some value. You can get some nutritional value out of something that started to rot as long as you don't cook it too rotten. I wonder if maybe it gives you a chance of getting food poisoning from that meal, perhaps. And there are a few things on here that we need to look at. First of all, uh, this slider is not much use on a, uh, a a cooking table, but it's more useful on things that, you know, the deconstruct things. So maybe you want to deconstruct stuff that is, you know, mostly broken. In this case, we're going to use everything. We're going to allow some rotten stuff. We're going to be able to make meat and vegetables, but not... This moon here means not everything is selected. Human meat is not selected by default. An earlier series of Avax was a... <laughs> cannibal colony, he would have turned human meat on because they would have at least not had a mood debuff if they'd eaten human meat. Maybe they get a mood buff. You also can't eat uh, fertilised eggs, but you can turn it on. We're going to leave it off. Chicken eggs unfertilised. There's way more other fertilised eggs that you can cook out of than unfertilised eggs, which is strange, but that's okay. And then anything vegetarian. So if you have a vegetarian in the colony, you want to make some simple meals out of everything and some simple meals out of just vegetarian so that you actually end up making literally vegetarian meals because when a meal is created it remembers what it was made of we're going to put the min cooker skill here to three this ensures let's have a look at work let's pause it a second tony has a cooking skill of three and high passion for it so tony will cook meals houston has a cooking skill of one and not and a small amount of passion for it they will not be cooking however it says prepare meals and butcher meat if we now set up a butcher's table architect Production, because, uh, okay, it's already on that. Uh, steel, have a wooden butcher's table, because steel is slightly more precious than wood. We'll put a butcher's table over here. Let's just click on this a second. You can deconstruct it. You cannot move this. You can take it apart, you can't move it. So we've made a blueprint for a butcher's table, which presumably Yefim will work on right now. It's going to move some steel. So Yefim is going to move basically this steel to that hole. Let's not do that. Let's look at the zone, because th this is one of the things about RimWorld. You click on someone and look at what they're doing, thinking they're about to do something. They're doing something you don't want them to be doing. That's inefficient. Actually, what we want to do is take the zone area, take our stockpile zone, and increase it. If we start inside the stockpile zone, in fact, if we click on it first, we found it. If we architect stockpile zone, now we know where it is, we can increase it by clicking anywhere inside it and dragging it. That will increase the size of it because... It always increases if you start inside the stockpile zone. If you don't, it makes a new one. Okay? I think it will also increase it if you start next to it. So do be careful. You might have to start in this direction or just deselect it. It will always create a new one if you start outside and deselect. If you start inside, I believe it always increases it. Let's try it. Yeah, it always increases it. And you can delete zones with this. If you drag like this, 
it deletes that part of it. If you click on it, I'm pretty sure it just deletes the whole zone, so do be careful there. So you are... Oh, you're actually stacking, so that's kind of okay, but... Yeah, now you've picked up the wood. So because there was nothing to do when he started doing that, he went to finish the hauling job. Now he's picking up wood, carrying it to the wooden butcher's table, and he'll build that. Let's speed it up so he finishes. Right, we'll pause it there. We have to add bills again. Always remember to do this. The number of times I forget, if you watch the stream, which I don't think we recorded actually, but on stream I will always forget to set up a bill. I'll just leave it and I'll be like, wow, these creatures not been butchered. Again, we will do this forever. Now if you look at the details of this, again, it won't butcher human-like corpses because people will get a debuff if they have to butcher a human. They'll be very upset by having to butcher a person. They will butcher any animal quite happily though. The min cooking skill is zero because you can't do it wrong. So now, if we have a look at the work tab, Houston's cooking skill, if he has nothing else to do, which may happen, then he will butcher and therefore practice his cooking skill. Otherwise, Tony will do everything, which I'm perfectly happy with at the moment. Uh, and of course, there's nothing to do at the moment anyway. There's no dead animals. But that's our basic food sorted out. Now, we actually need stuff to cook. First of all, you can hunt things. If you double click here, we select all boars. We can just hunt this boar if you wanted to. If we have a look at the work. Tony is a level 3 hunt. It's got hunting on next priority. Which kind of makes sense, because if there's no food left and you set up a hunting job, Tony will go and hunt it. Provided there's nothing else to do. I may put this up to two. Now, there's two different things here. First of all, if you look at Avax's latest series, he realises that it might actually just simply be easier to recruit everybody and send them off to hunt. You can set up people to do a hunting job and eventually that thing will be hunted by that person. Tony, what are you carrying? A knife. That might be bad. <laughs> like, I'm not quite sure what would happen if you sent that person off. So I might do what Avak's currently doing. What Avak is currently doing is having nobody on hunting and then whenever we want something to be killed, we get everyone, we send them over, we shoot it and we carry it back. That works well, except in one of my uh, single player playthroughs that I'm doing at the moment. Uh, let's look at work. The I have one person who basically has, see this blank here, this person will not do this kind of work. This is the, the hunting, remember it said um, that they are incapable of violence, so they won't shoot and they won't melee, but they also will refuse to hunt, because that's violent. So if we go back to the work tab, you see that Yefim, who was... Remember the, the kid who was scared of fire? Not going to do fire fighting. You can't even assign it. Sometimes they're just really bad at it and have zero skill. Sometimes they will not do it at all. I have a person who basically won't do anything except for art and hunting for some reason. But she's really good at hunting, but she won't haul. Now, if you set up a hunting job, the hunter will bring back the body, even if the hunter cannot haul. However... Everyone we've got can haul. So if we just tell them to kill it, then someone will bring it back anyway. So let's try that. This person has a uh, bolt action rifle. They are reasonably good at shooting. So we'll show two mechanics at once. First of all, cooking. Second of all, recruiting. Recruiting is what's going to happen if you need them to attack something like a raid. Press this draft button here. They drop what they're doing. They arm their weapon. And now you can tell them what to do. So if I right click, if I left click, you deselect. If you right click, you get a circle. The circle is where they're going to move. Okay. So this person is under my control. Now I have drafted them. I can always send them back. If you undraft them, they just go back to doing whatever seems most useful at the time. If I now right click on this, I can fire at it or I can melee attack it. I'm going to fire at it. You can also press B. If you press B, this is the range of that weapon. And then you can... Specifically, oh, I right clicked. That was my mistake. So they aim, they fire. So you can press B and it will show you the range of it, which is really useful. Oh, good shot. Uh, now that he's finished, you undraft him. This is forbidden. So we press F and they will pick it up. Now we can do this. No empty players configured to store it. Right, because we told this one. Corpses. There we go. We decided this one wouldn't contain animal corpses. It's going to need to because otherwise animals will die too far away from the butcher table and they won't do anything about it. So let's recap what just happened there. I shot this. 
with him drafted. When he's drafted, you can use the button and he will shoot things, right? You undraft him and now he's back to normal. So he's going to be doing jobs off of the work schedule. I wanted him to haul this corpse, which he's now already doing. But earlier, oh, well, let's go back to what we were on. Earlier, we said you can't store animal corpses here. We set that up just to avoid animal corpses rotting. So when I try to do this, cannot haul wild boar corpse, no empty place configured to store it. There is nowhere that is allowed to store animal corpses. So I press storage, press animal corpses. Now he is allowed to store that corpse in that location. So I, well, then I tried to force him to do it, but he's already doing it because he's a hard worker. He's an amazing person. Once that's available, Tony, wherever she's gone, uh, she's apparently under Houston. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> Cleaned up a bit of rock rubble, if you saw that. Uh, and then he's going to continue with that mining job. When that mining job is finished, I'm hoping that Tony will go ahead and butcher that corpse. Which is exactly what's happening. When the corpse is butchered, she will probably take the meat to here. And then use the meat to cook meals and then take the meals to here. Thus, the cycle of life begins and continues. So anytime we need more meat, we can just recruit somebody, send them off to kill a boar and have done with. And then Tony will cook the boar. So she's put half the meat away in the stockpile and is going to cook the other half. Well, let's see what we've got. We have 41 boar meat here and she's cooking 10 of them. This is going to be a pain. That will make four meals. And then there'll be one meat left over, which will slowly start to rot. In order to make that meat go further, we can grow crops. Because if we click on bills and we have a look at the details here, remember we said we're using all vegetarian stuff as well as all meat. And there's no difference between the meats. It's not like they're going to be like sad for eating any of the meats, except human meat. We can actually also create a zone, a growing zone. So here's all our zones. Remember, zone area, growing zone. We expand all this sort of stuff with grass on is soil and you can grow on it. And it'll tell you where you can grow because when you try to draw the zone, the squares just won't exist if you can't grow there. That's fine. But we want a growing zone fairly close to our colony in a sort of a protectable area. And that's one of the reasons I chose the area between these two things. We can wall these off and make ourselves a nice large sort of farming area plus space for all our other rooms and things that we need. So let's make a nice large growing zone. We do have some growers. Seven by seven seems like a minimum in my opinion. So I'm gonna go 11 by 11, which is a lot of zone. I'm gonna create two of them. And you can just about see them on the ground. They're not, they don't show up that much, but they do show up. And anyone who's set to grow will now start to plant things in here. If I click this, it says potato plant here and potato plant here. So growing is the bills for the growing zone. We don't want everything to be potato plant. That's boring. So I think we grow strawberries. Strawberries grow quite easily. Again, we can click on the information thing. There's always an information thing. Harvestable, fertility, flammability, blah, blah, blah. Uh, nutrition 0.2. So not very nutritious. Compared to potatoes, oh, they're exactly as nutritious as potatoes, which is crazy. But when we have vegetarian things, we would use less meat per meal. So once these have grown, we will have them, and then the meat will go further. But until then, we can just keep killing boars until we're bored of them. <laughs> now, there's a third type of crop that's very useful to create. So we're going to go back to architect and zone and growing zone. And I'm going to sort of do this um, like this. I like to have sort of a... I don't like just to be squares, basically. I like to have some sort of extra layout. And I'm going to grow maybe a 4 by 23. And then here, we're going to grow heel root. Now, heel root takes a long time to grow compared to at least... Let's just double check these before I go on about it. So, growing time, three days for potatoes. Less time for strawberries, which is quite nice. So, strawberries are kind of nicer than potatoes in that respect. But heel root, six days. And don't forget, there's only, I think, 30 days in a season, and there's only four seasons. So that's a reasonably large proportion of the growing period is going to be spent growing heel root. However, heel root turns into natural medicine, and natural medicine augments our ability to actually heal people because we only have 24 medicine, and at some point we're going to eat through all of that and wish we'd started growing heel root. So now I've gone back in time from when we wished that we had grown more heel root, and I'm doing it in preparation for the first raid. So let's uh, speed up and see if anybody is going to grow. Houston is growing, as anticipated. Why? Because Houston's grow 
is a two and mining is a three. They were mining and when they finish the mining job, they're prioritizing the growing job. And we'll also see, if we click on character, uh, sorry, needs, they're growing more and more, that's a plus one, not plus two, okay. They're growing more and more plants, which apparently make up out of 15? Nope, 16. So as they sow these plants, they're gonna become more and more happy. So they really enjoy doing this. Again, I don't have the mod that Avak's using that shows us the colonists. At this stage, it doesn't really matter. And I don't have the mod that allows him to box select and unforbid things. But again, it's just a quality of life mod. It doesn't actually change the gameplay. Well, this has been a, quite a long episode, I just realised. So I'm going to call it here. We've learned about growing. We've learned about, you know work. This is probably one of the most important things and possibly one of the most confusing things that you'll see people doing in Let's Plays. So hopefully that was a, a good overview of why people put those things as they do. Again, Quill will use ones and twos all over the place. Avak will use two and down. And I kind of prefer Avak's way of doing it now that I've learned about it. And I do recommend it because it just means you can make anything an emergency task at any time without having to deprioritize everything else, which is super useful. Um, and there's one more thing I will tell you, in fact. If I go to this zone, and we'll expand this stockpile zone here, you can also create a dumping stockpile zone, which I will create over here. And what this will do... Well, let's just have a look at it. If you have a look at the storage in here, it's basically the opposite of what the original one was. It's all chunks and all corpses. I'm going to turn off... No, what I'll do is... See, this priority. This is normal priority. So I'm going to actually do this low priority. This is a low priority storage for animal corpses, mechanoid and human-like corpses, including, well, in this one we didn't allow human corpses. We did allow animal corpses. What I'm also gonna do, but well, what's also happened, allow rotten is not true. If we butcher something and it gets, uh, sorry, if we kill something and it gets brought back and no one butchers it, it will slowly rot. Once it's rotten, it will be moved here. But this is low priority. So anything that could be in here or here will be in here first. What's going to happen now is that anything that I say to get rid of, like these chunks here, will end up in here. Because you don't keep chunks in here. Yeah? There's also these chunks here. What's this? Oh, there's steel behind there. Okay. These things here, as long as these are not currently flagged to be removed. So that's another separation between this sort of thing and this sort of thing. This sort of thing is stuff that people want and therefore you have to forbid it if you want to stop them from using it. This sort of stuff is things that ignore. You have to explicitly prioritize it if you want them to go and get it. So in this case, people will ignore these until I click this button, at which point they will haul it. Contrary-wise, anything like this in the world, they will normally try and go and get it unless it's forbidden, which is why these things start off as forbidden, because otherwise they end up walking across the map potentially through dangerous territory in order to pick up something. So you have to explicitly allow those and you have to explicitly request these. And they will end up in here. Now these are ugly, so that's why I'm moving them out of here. And Tony's going to continue mining, but we'll see about that in the next episode. Remember, if you have any questions, if I haven't explained anything thoroughly enough, please do leave a question in the comments. Uh, please do leave a like if you have appreciated this series and I will continue it when I get some requests or just when I feel like it. But thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next episode.